Hello and welcome to Sunday School for Sunday, November 1st. And we'll be looking at the session, session 9, which is titled God Acts. And it comes from Isaiah 46, verses 3 through 13. I was thinking about, we just uh, had the celebration of Halloween. I don't know if you've celebrated Halloween in the past or if you have recently, but typically with Halloween, people like to put on uh, costumes and uh, go to parties and uh, pretend uh, to be other things, things other than themselves. And I remember being a child, uh, how much fun it was to put on a costume, whatever it was, because it's always fun to dress up as someone else. Well, we're looking at a passage today where the Israelites are a part of the Babylonian people uh, but part of the, the celebration that goes on in Babylon was a special holiday that where uh, the Babylonians would grab the altar, the uh, gods that they had made, the, the god Nebo and the god Bel, the, those idols, and they would carry them around. They'd actually put them on carts and have them uh, carried around by uh, oxen and uh, other animals that would carry them throughout the streets. And uh, it was one of those things that was kind of cu culturally uh, I guess celebrated around the Israelites, but the Israelites themselves did not celebrate or were not supposed to celebrate. Uh, and so God kind of uses this as an opportunity. And I tell you that, that little illustration because that kind of is the reference point for what God says throughout the rest of this. And the point, of course, of this session today is that the one true God is incomparable and that he will complete his plan to save his people. Uh, Isaiah chapter 31, excuse me, chapter 46, verses uh, 3 through 7 says, The true God, this is the, the title, the true God. It says, Listen to me, house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been sustained from the womb, carried along since birth. I will be the same until your old age, and I will bear you up when you turn gray. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will bear and rescue you. To whom will you compare me? or make me equal, who will you measure me with so that we should so that we should be like each other? Those who pour out their bags of gold and silver uh, out on the scales, they hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a God. They kneel and bow down to it. They lift up their shoulder and bear it along. They set it on its place and there it stands. It does not budge from its place. They carry it at they carry out, excuse me, they cry out to it, but it doesn't answer. It saves no one from his trouble. You see this picture, this contrast that God is trying to draw up with this Babylonian celebration that as they are celebrating uh, this uh, holiday, uh, they are carrying around these heavy gods made of stone or made of uh, various materials and made of gold. And they're supposed to be really pretty. Uh, but they're also very heavy and they have to carry them around because they don't move on their own. And God has this picture, this, uh, the, he says, take a look at all of these gods and ask yourself, are they really gods? I don't know if you've been to Bass Pro Shop or uh, maybe to someone's place who has a, a taxidermied bear or a mountain lion or something like that. Typically, when you have a, a predator kind of animal like that, taxidermy, you have it uh, kind of set up in this, you know, scary teeth bearing uh, claws out. Uh, it looks like it's about to attack you. And I love the contrast that a lot of times it happens. People say, go stand next to the bear and we'll take your picture. Because if that were a real bear, and when I say real, I mean alive. If that were an alive bear, there is no way you would set your children over there and say, one, two, three, cheese. Not at all. But what we've done is we've taken this very real thing and we've taken out all the stuff that looks like that, that is real and put in all this sawdust to make it look real. And God has this picture here that he says, look at all these, quote, gods that are supposed to look real, that are supposed to look ferocious and ask yourself, can they even do anything like stand up or move on their own? God calls his people, the Israelites, he, he calls them the line of Jacob. He calls them Israel. And he says, I'm the one who has sustained you and I will continue to sustain you. He has this picture about uh, them growing old, that he'll sustain them even whenever they, they become gray. 
And I love parents and grandparents. I love my parents. I love my grandparents. Uh, the one downside of parents and grandparents, as many of you may have experienced already, uh, is that they no longer remain in that capacity of a leader, a supervisor. My, all four of my grandparents have passed away. Uh, my, my parents are still here and I'm glad to have them, but there'll be a day. Uh, and so uh, the problem that we have is we all grow older and even us who are parents, someday we won't be there for our kids. And uh, it's a difficult thought to think about. Uh, one of my mom's favorite books is called uh, I Love You Forever by Robert Munch. And it's a picture book. And it's a story of a mother who has a baby and she rocks him every night and says, I love you forever. I'll love you for always. As long as my as long as you're living, my baby, you'll be. And the funny thing about that story is she does it not only when he's a baby, but when he's a toddler and a child and a teenager and even an adult. And of course, this is a picture book, so it's not weird. But the mom goes over to the adult's house and scoops him up in her arms at night and sings the same little song. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. Right. Uh, until finally, the, the, it comes the time when the mother in the book becomes old and sick and frail on her own. And the son picks her up and holds her in his arms and says, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as you're living, my mother, you'll be. There's that picture that, that it's kind of a difficult realization in life. But the good news that we see out of that is God is not a father who ever grows old. God has been constant from before you were born and he will be constant through the day of your death so that you can trust him in everything. God is the same, unchanging from your childhood to long after you are old. And God reminds the Israelites that he made them and he will save them from their captivity. And he points out the foolishness of idolatry. He says, number one, it's expensive. You're dumping out your silver and gold, right? Number two, you have to carry it because it's pretty heavy. And then number three, when you put it down, it can't move. It's, it's kind of like uh, getting one of those taxidermied bears and setting it up as the guard of your house. It looks ferocious, but it doesn't actually do anything. Go ahead and get yourself a little, you know, little dog that you can afford. That would have far more effect than a taxidermied bear. And when people cry out to these little gods, they actually can't do anything. And so the encouragement here for God's people is to cling to the living God. He says in verse 40, verses 8 uh, through 11 of chapter 46, he calls himself the trustworthy one. He, he says, remember this and be brave. Take it to heart, you transgressors. Remember what happened long ago. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from and from long ago what is not yet saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. I call a bird of prey from the east, a man for my purpose from a far country. Yes, I have spoken, so I will also bring it about. I have planned it and I will also do it. There's this call to action right at the beginning. He, he says, let this knowledge, he tells you to remember and then let this knowledge move you to act. What should we remember? Probably we could apply the things that we just read, that we remember that idols are nothing and so they're not worthy of our worship. Perhaps it's what he says after that, that God orders our days and we can trust him alone. But he says to be brave and to take it to heart, trusting in God alone not participating in the cultural idol worship, not uh, thinking about or valuing or desiring the things that the culture wants, but listening only to God, trusting in the Lord to say, what is it, Lord, that is valuable and that matters? And then putting those things into our life, living as distinct believers in the world in which we live. Uh, I remember the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they distinguished themselves as the the sons of Israel in the Babylonian captivity. And they, they distinguished themselves by serving God alone. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's golden idol. Uh, Daniel refused to back down whenever uh, they called on him to stop praying to his God. Uh, those young men, and actually that last story is an old, a picture of Daniel as an old man. Uh, those guys living out what God was saying to Israel here in their Babylonian captivity. He says that God uh, was going to rescue his people from captivity if only they would trust him. God declares the end from the beginning. His plan will take place. 
And the big picture here is that the exile is not a mistake. Uh, that, that God's intentions for e Israel, even in the midst of difficult times, were for their good. I, I thought about the movie Ocean's Eleven. I thought of the more recent one. If you remember the older one, maybe it applies as well. But even when it looked like all of the plan was falling apart and nothing was working, if you just hold on and keep watching, you will find that it has all been a part of the plan all along and everything is going according to plan. God is a great planner and he's not just some great planner. He is a great sovereign actor, even over all uh, creation, over everything that he has made. And so God's plans will always come to fulfillment. And God makes this prediction. He says, I'm going to uh, bring a bird of prey from the east. And as we look, we he even is named later that that's Cyrus, the ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire, who comes to judge the nation of Babylon. And comes to actually deliver Israel, send Cyrus, sends the Jews back to their home place, back to the promised land. And we see that God's uh, captivity of, excuse me, Israel's captivity is all part of God's plan. To be honest with you, it kind of reminds us that even back in Exodus, even back when, when uh, Joseph and his family went to Egypt and they became slaves there, you begin to go, well, what's the problem? Why, why are we here? Why is this such, why are we in this bad place? Well, you read the book of Exodus and you see how God launches a nation out of Egypt and to a nation that regards him as sovereign as, as, as better than uh, the place where they came from. Uh, and you see that uh, uh, that same God is in control here in Babylon, that God has carried them into captivity, not necessarily as punishment, but as discipline, a restorative factor, a restoration, so that they, would make, so they might never again struggle with idolatry as a nation. As I know everyone jokes about 2020 being the worst year ever, uh, and probably there's not a lot of joking in, involved in it. There's really been a lot of bad things, really a lot of frustrating things that have happened this year and that continue to happen this year. But here's the question is, in the midst of whatever genuine struggles we have, uh, can you trust God in the midst of that challenge? Isaiah writes in uh, chapter 46, verses 12 and 13, he, he talks about God as the just one. He says, listen to me, you hard hearted, far removed from justice. I am bringing my justice near. It is not far away and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion, my splendor in Israel. I thought about the, the character Little Orphan Annie. If you've seen the, I guess, 1982 movie Orphan Annie or, or Annie, uh, maybe just if you know about the series, Annie is sort of this uh, character uh, who is constantly uh, trusting, waiting, believing that her parents are coming. She's, she's always hopeful that her parents will come back or perhaps that she'll be adopted. And there are other, these other older children who've been as part of the orphanage for a lot longer uh, and they're sort of jaded. and they, they tend to tell her there's nothing that's coming. There's nothing good. In fact, the, the old song, it's a hard knock life for us. That comes from this, this perspective. It's been this way for as long as we can remember. You might as well just give up hope. And yet Annie is always hopeful for the coming of her parents or the coming of someone to be her parents. And so even though it's been a long time for Israel, Things will be better. It's been a long time since things were better, but, but it's, it's just hard to see right now. But God hasn't forgotten. God continues uh, to bring about his plan to restore his people. And God calls his people to trust him and to know that he has not given up on them. And his salvation is coming. Deliverance would happen on God's timetable. It would not delay, but would come exactly at the time he determined. And God described this as my salvation. It belonged to him. The people who could do nothing to save themselves, idols certainly could not save them. Only God could deliver them and return them to their land. And the restoration of the people had always been God's plan. The exile and the punishment were always meant to produce the needed change in their hearts of the people so that they could be restored to the right relationship with the Lord. The purpose of the discipline is always restoration. God's plan was to restore Israel to himself, to bring them near to himself in Zion in the promised land, so as to show himself glorious in all the world, that they would once again see the glory of God demonstrated in his love toward his people. 
I thought about the song, Is He Worthy? Uh, by Andrew Peterson. And it's a, it's a call and answer song. In other words, there's a question asked and then there's an answer that's responded. And, and the questions just are, are good theological questions to cause us to reflect about who God is, who God has been, who God is and what God is doing. And the response is always he is, he was, he does, right? Uh, but there's one part of that song that always gets me. Every time I hear it, uh, it just, uh, it, it just, I don't know. I, I, I become emotional thinking about it. And it says, does the father truly love us? And the choir sings, he does. Does the spirit move among us? And the choir sings, he does. Does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? And the response is, he does. And this is the one that gets me. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. In the midst of everything that, that Israel was going through, they could trust that God was, was still bringing about his plan of restoration. And in the things that you and I are going through, we can know if, if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, he is coming again. That's the picture that he will come again one day to wipe away all the problems, all the brokenness, and to restore, to create a new heaven and a new earth and a new place where he will dwell with his people and does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Looking forward to that day when dad comes home. Whenever we're uh, brought back into uh, community with him. And so to summarize here, we, let me just kind of go over what we, what we pointed out. That, that first of all, that the one true God is able to save his people. And secondly, that the one true God continues to demonstrate his power and his trustworthiness. But more than that, that the one true God provides his eternal plan of salvation for his people. And so let me give you some questions to think about as we uh, move, as we uh, wrap up this session here. Uh, first of all, what idols do you think you have in your life that are keeping you from truly worshiping God and truly trusting in God? Number two, in what areas of your life are you in need of God's assurance that he is coming, that he is restoring, that he is working to bring about his plan? And finally, what can you share with someone this week about trusting in God alone? Thank you so much for joining me and let me pray for us and we can move on with the rest of our uh, worship time. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your grace towards us. Lord, help us to listen to you. In your name I pray, amen.